morning. Hello and happy Sabbath, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all here with us on this beautiful Sabbath morning, our first Sabbath in September. Amen. Hopefully that also means slightly cooler weather will be heading in our direction soon. Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to the Tempe Seventh-day Adventist Church. So whether you are here worshiping with us in person or online, we are just very, very happy that you are here with us today. I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Is, do we have any visitors here today? Like, hello! Where are you visiting us from? church and so they're kind of church browsing around the area we are so glad that you're visiting today we hope that you really enjoy Tempe I mean you know we would love for you to think of Tempe as perhaps your permanent home but we understand you know that you may need to look but we really hope that you like us here we are so glad to see you this morning thank you oh, do we have any other visitors with us today all right, well, I'm not going to call anybody out because I know some people might be more introverted or, or that, but I just want to let everybody know whether you are a first-time visitor, a third-time visitor, a six-month visitor, or a permanent member of our church, we are just so happy to see you this morning. We are glad that you have joined us today to worship our Lord Jesus Christ together. Um, at this time, we are going to have church news. First. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, the latest one I have in your bulletin it says that fellowship lunch next week and breakfast the week after are canceled. The current information I have is only the potluck next week is canceled. The Saturday, uh, breakfast is still on. That's the latest one I had. Uh, be sure to check those next week. Uh, we have Zoom Bible study every Tuesday at 7 8 p.m. And Zoom ID is in the bulletin. Young Adult Bible study with Chris is on Friday nights. Contact information is there. We have the Holiday Cooking Seminar on the 6th of November at 4 p.m. here at the Tempe Church. You can learn the principles of healthy cooking. And we have Hot my cover for June on the 17th. And the Bible work training at the Community of University and Church, September 23rd to the 25th. Uh, and again, Pastor Mike Soto will be here on the 24th. And we have a women's retreat October 7th to the 9th with Kathy Abbott. The contact information is here at ABSDAWomen at Point, uh, briefly .com. No, very verse. Right here. Isaiah 43. Have a Sabbath? I just want to hear. <laughs> All right, so our Bible reading this morning, we're going to find it in Isaiah 43 7. <laughs> like this. Bring back everyone who belongs to me. I created them to bring to bring glory to me. I formed them and made them. May God bless his word. joining us near the end of this month. How many of you are excited? Amen. All right. 
right, well, as we begin our worship service today, we are going to sing a couple of hymns of praise to the Lord. So I just welcome you to grab a hymnal from the pew in front of you. Also, we have the words on the screen as well. Our first hymn that we are going to sing this morning is When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, hymn number 216. Hymn number 216.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are um, all powerful. Um, nothing is too big for you. We thank you that you are uh, loving and gracious and uh, merciful to us. Um, thank you that you care for us. And uh, we want to worship you this morning for that and many other wonderful things. Um, you are worthy of our praise. And so we adore you this morning and ask that you would bless our service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. At this time, we have our children's story. So if we have any children, please come on up. I will be giving the children's story today. Welcome, welcome. Yes, so I am showing the children. I'll lift it up. I'm not sure if any of you can see, but this is a rock collection that our oldest got for his sixth birthday with some very cool rocks in here. There's all different types of rocks. There are, you know, quartz that are shiny. There's tiger eye that's been polished, so it's shiny, but the, you know, it's colorful. Someone said there's different patterns and stripes. Ooh, what's this super shiny one? Do you remember, Benji? I found it. False gold. Right. False we even gold. have fool's gold or false gold in here as well. Not real, I promise. Yeah. So. You know, stones are really cool. How many of you like to go outside, maybe in your yard or at a park, and like find cool things on the ground? Yeah? You found a seashell? That is awesome. It is so much fun to look down at the ground and see what amazing things we can find. We can find sometimes seashells, depending on where we are. We can find uh, bugs. Who, how many no. of you guys like bugs? I'm not surprised. Yeah. Well, some. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. You, you found trash. Yes, sometimes you can even find trash on the ground. Good job, Remy. We'll make sure to throw that away. And sometimes we find rocks. Now, are all rocks just plain little pebbles? No. no. Sometimes, if you know what to look for, you can find something special like one of these shiny rocks they may not be shiny when you find them they may be dusty and dirty well, if you wash them off, they're yeah when you wash them off but how do you know a regular pebble or rock from something special let's take a look at these what do you think some of them are plain i heard one of you say that yeah and some are maybe different colors, you know? Yeah, that one's really cool. That one's kind of gray and green. Yes, there's rocks everywhere. There's rocks in the desert. There's rocks in the jungle. Very good. Sometimes the ones in jungles or forests are a little harder to find. Sometimes you have to move grass and you have to move dirt to find the good rocks. Now today I want to share with you a couple of special rocks, okay? If I can get it out of here. There we go. And one more. There we go. All right. So, 
Let's take a look at these three rocks. They're kind of dusty looking. They're not shiny. If you saw them on the ground, would you think these rocks are special? Yeah. Yeah, because they have cool, they're cool. They have kind of a stripe. Yeah, and they're like, this, yeah. They're like yeah. one's like a cylinder kind of. Yeah, yeah. that one. is so important. These rocks, I'll hold them up so the grown-ups can kind of see them too. So, here's a bigger one. Here's one of the biggest ones we ever found. These rocks are called chiastolites. Can you say that big word? Chiastolites. They are formed when you have a crystal that is, what's a good way of saying it so kids can understand? Kind of like infected by another mineral. So in this case, you have a crystal that has something called graphite. Graphite, that's like the gray stuff in pencils that you write with. Okay? Now, these rocks are formed in cylinders, long cylinders, and as they get moved around and that, they tend to break into smaller and smaller pieces. That's why, like, this one's super little. Now, you can find these type of rocks in different places around the world. However, the chiastolites that I am holding in my hand are very unique. I'm going to lick a rock. All right. Here we go. What do you see on this rock? Did you wash it before you lift it? Yes, these have definitely been washed. <laughs> it looks like an X, or sometimes people think a plus sign, or a um, cross, like you can kind of see it in that one. The graphite is the gray part that makes the X. Let's see if I can get the little one. This one, the X is almost a square. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now, this particular color variation, the black of the graphite and the orange of the regular crystal-like part of the rock, are only found in two places in the entire world. You can find cousins of the chiastolites in different colors other places. But with the orange and black combination, they're only found in two places. Can you guess? You want to guess where these might be found? In the world. Well, in the on world, the yeah. On the ground, yeah. But in the desert. In the desert, close. These, this specific type of chiastolite is found in a small region in China and in a small area called Chowchilla, California. They occur naturally there. I have family, my mother-in-law, her family's from Chowchilla. They grew up finding these on the ground everywhere. And when we went there this summer, we collected a whole bunch. They just are on the ground. And this was the very biggest one we ever found. I don't know if any of you can see that cool X or cross right there in that rock. These um, type of rocks a long time ago were often called cross stones because the X kind of looks like a cross. They're very special and they don't happen everywhere. It takes a certain type of environment to create them. And that is kind of an interesting part of this story. When you see this dusty rock on the ground in the middle of dusty dirt, surrounded by other dusty gray rocks, you might not even know it's special. You might walk right past it without even thinking. But if you know what you're looking for as you're walking, you might be able to tell that rock doesn't have a normal rock shape. It looks like a cylinder. There's something special. I'm going to pick it up. And then if you know what to look for, you can see the special hidden X or cross in the rock. Isn't that amazing? So, part of this story is basically a lesson. A lesson that sometimes people and things may look ordinary and unimportant if, we're, if we don't know what we're looking for. But Jesus tells us that every person 
is special and loved by God. So if we know what we're looking for, we realize how special something ordinary may really be. So that is one reason why we read the Bible, so we can learn what God and Jesus wants us to learn. And Jesus tells us that he loves each and every one of us. And that includes other people too. So we need to do what Jesus tells us to do. We need to be kind to other people because they may be a little dusty on the outside. Maybe they look a little ordinary, but don't we all, right? But everybody is special. Everyone is special to God. All right, let's bow our heads and have prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for teaching us this important lesson that every single person is loved by you and that each and every one of us are special. And Lord, we thank you for the amazing creation that you have created all around us that help us learn these lessons, like the amazing Pelasgolites that look ordinary at first, but if we know what to look for, turn out to be very special. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you may go back to your seats. Thank you for that children's story, Jacqueline. Uh, our deacon will wait on us now for the offering. I want to remind everybody that for the offering, um, anything loose in the envelope or in the plate not designated will go to the local budget. If you have a particular mission that you want to support, please put it in the tithe envelope and mark it accordingly, and we will direct your funds as you direct. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, employment and needs that you supply to us that we may live. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to return the tithe and give offerings that further your work. We ask you to bless it, multiply it, and send it forth wherever you think it needs to be that, so that your glory is, is increased and your goals for this earth are met. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled, but yet desiring and pleased and grateful 
that in this country we can come and worship you as we understand we can and we need to, and that your presence is always with us. You are an awesome God that can speak worlds and solar systems into existence. But yet, you, not only do you want to spend time, but you desire it. It is your craving. You desire to spend time with your creation, be close to that. You seek Him out. What a wonderful God and an awesome God that, that makes you. Lord, we ask for blessings for employment and graduations. And we ask you to be with and encourage and strengthen those that are maybe in between jobs or struggling with a job that's difficult. We ask you to bless them and pour out your spirit for them that they may be able to sustain their their employment and eventually move on to where they are happy and still serve you. Lord, health is a, a, another two-inch uh, sword. You know, we have people that are healthy and we ask, we thank you for that blessing. But people are struggling with health issues, mostly COVID-19, cancer, diabetes, heart problems. But Lord, we know that you provided a solution and that you are with each and every one that has Position. We ask you to enlighten their minds and help them to heal, because we know, Lord, that you can. We can heal everything. And we ask that, Lord, we ask you to bless the speaker today, Elder Chris, that he may deliver your words to us, and that we may be filled with your spirit at, on this day. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My own mic this morning. I'm a little under, under the weather today. I know it's hot outside, but I have a cold. It's supposed to be a joke for you, but it's true. Yes. Um, so I apologize. I don't have the energy I normally have, so please be uh, bear with me as I uh, go through this. Um, and if you think of it, pray for me as I speak. Um, and pardon the sniffles as we go through the <laughs> sermon. All right, so uh, today's sermon is about knowing your purpose. Uh, so, question for you, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? One question, God, what would it be? Well, um, yeah, sure, go ahead. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Well, that's a good question. That relates to our topic very well this morning. Anyone else? We'll take it. Oops, one more. Checking over the other mic cord here. Oh yeah, yourself. How many stars are in the sky? How many stars in the sky? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so a long time ago I asked some ASU students that question. Um, what would you guess a uh, college students uh, answer that question would be? How many of you are college students? Raise your hand. Let's say there's at least three hands that go up. Um, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll share. Um, one of the top answers was, what is my purpose? Which relates to this. And um, apparently that question does not go away even as age increases, as uh, Marilyn has a, essentially the same question. Um, it's one of the most fundamental questions of life's existence. Why am I here and what am I supposed to do uh, with my life? Um, or what am I able to do today? Um, so let's take a look at two verses. One with the uh, scripture reading. We'll start there, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. I think we'll find that the sermon is going to start very general and then go as specific as we can. 
Um, so just generally speaking, why were we created and put here? Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. So this, this verse can be a little awkward to read based on your translation just because it's the middle of the thought. So if it's in, not a complete sentence, um, just bear with me. Um, Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. Uh, God was speaking about his people that his plan was to bring them back and everyone who was going to be brought back he said everyone who was called by my name whom I have created for my glory I have formed him yes I have made him so God has created us uh, to give him glory um, and what does it mean to give God glory we could put that in other words um, basically to make God look good um, and that is a desirable thing to do because God is love and worthy of glory and honor. So we are created to give God glory. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Some of you may know what comes in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Um, that's the passage that says that we're saved um, by grace alone through faith. Uh, so, uh, verse 10 is kind of the end of that thought, and it explains another reason why we're created. Uh, verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Yeah. You are created to do good works, of which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, uh, through Jesus, we are created for uh, good works. And so, knowing your purpose and God's will for your life are pretty related topics, so we're going to be focusing on how to know God's will for your life. That's what we'll be talking about um, in the sermon. So, I'm going to start off by talking about God's general will. Basically, this is true for all of you at all points of your life. Um, and then we'll get to specifics. Let's we'll start in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 4. I have four verses here that mention specific things um, that are God's will for you at all times of your life. It's true for everybody in all places. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, First Timothy chapter 2, in verse 4, uh, this is another statement that's in context of a larger statement. Um, it's kind of like a throwaway thought. Paul, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy and he's like, do this, and he mentions the name of God, and then he makes this like one-liner. Uh, that doesn't necessarily relate to the original statement, but it's true of itself that God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So, are you included in all people? Yeah, so that's God's will for you. Uh, number one, to be saved and to know the truth. So, if we were to summarize what it means to be saved, uh, God is love. Sin separates us from God and leads to a permanent death. Jesus took on your guilt and paid the penalty of death. If you believe in him, you will have everlasting life. Um, that is the gospel. And that's God's will for you to believe in him and be saved. All right, number two, God's will for you, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19. Second Peter chapter 3. Um, verse 9. There is no verse 19 in chapter 3, so my notes are wrong. That's a typo. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. <laughs> Did anyone notice that before I said it? Okay. <laughs> Second Peter chapter three verse nine. Um, you know, I guess the theme of all these verses so far is that there's important statements that are made in terms of in larger discussions going on in scripture. So this particular passage is talking about the nearness and timing of Jesus to return. But in the middle of it, uh, again, the statement is made. Uh, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his son count slackness, uh, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. So according to this verse, what is God's will for you? 
salvation, but specifically, what's the word? Operative word to repent. God wants you to repent of your sins. Um, and this connects with the previous uh, verse that we read. When we believe in Jesus, we also repent of our sins, which means that we are willing to change our way of living. Um, and if you have that willingness, Jesus will forgive you and give you the power to change and to live another life. Um, so, one, to be saved, and two, to repent. Okay, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians, back in that T section of the New Testament. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is in verse 3. I'm just going to read the first half of this verse. Uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 3, which says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So God wants you uh, to experience sanctification. Uh, which, in uh, simple terms, is the transformation of our character into being like God's character. Now, this is part of the daily relationship with Jesus that happens when we live by faith. God wants us to experience sanctification. Okay, uh, let's go to chapter 5, since we're there in 1 Thessalonians. Um, there's another God's will statement. We're going to read that over here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, 16 through 18 says here that we should rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what's God's will for you in this verse? Yeah, rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks. Um, so that's God's will for us. And I think that's part of that daily relationship that happens with Jesus. We're supposed to, we're supposed to talk with him. And our conversation is supposed to be multidimensional, um, not just asking for requests, but it's supposed to be um, multidirectional. Um, our, the type of relationship that we should have uh, with the Lord when we pray is the opening of a heart as to a friend. Um, so we have that relationship with him. So this is God's will for us. It's true for everybody in all places at all times. God wants you to be saved. Uh, he wants you to repent. He wants you to experience sanctification and to have joy, pray, and give thanks in all circumstances. So that's God's will for you. Um, and although um, there's other things in the Bible that don't include the terminology, the verbiage that this is God's will, do this. Um, but I think it's not a stretch to say that if we included, for example, God's commandments, um, that would be God's will for you uh, to keep his commandments. And so we have uh, verses from Jesus saying, for example, that the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, this would also be God's will for you. And all of the story of Scripture hangs on these two principles. Uh, this includes the Ten Commandments, and this includes knowing Christ for yourself, uh, which is the basis for eternal life. So that's God's will for everyone. Um, so then, what about God's specific will for you that's different from the person sitting next to you? Um, his will for you is an individual, and like his will for you in daily life decisions. So this includes major life decisions, such as uh, where to live, uh, what career to have, who to marry, um, and smaller decisions we make day to day. Um, I think we're going to even uh, get to the level of what shirt to wear and what pen to use when taking notes. Um, we'll talk about that. Okay, God gives us a promise though. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 8. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 8. I wonder if I should ask this now. How many of you think that God's plan for your life includes what shirt you should wear every day? How many of you would say yes to that? How many of you would say no to that? Okay, we have, we have a depend, depends. Okay, um, I'll circle back on that and we'll uh, have a discussion about that afterwards. 
Uh, Psalm chapter 32, verse 8, God gives us the promise. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. So, uh, using you know the illustration of directions as a in, in terms of life direction, God is going to guide our path through life. He's given us that promise. So then the question is, how does He instruct us? How does God reveal His specific will to us? And so I have here that there are uh, three primary ways in which God reveals His will to us. Uh, the first is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So the first of three primary ways in which God reveals his will to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This passage here says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, speaking of good works, where have we heard that before? Anyone remember the term good works, where that came from earlier in the sermon? The Ephesians, that's one of the purposes we were created for. So scripture instructs us to achieve the, our purpose, which is pretty cool. Scripture teaches what we need to be spiritually mature as people. So that is the uh, one way in which God reveals his will to us. Uh, the second, I have Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. You have to infer a little bit from this verse, uh, but I don't think it's a big jump. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, and verse 9. Here it says that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So what I take from this is that God will use circumstances to shape your life. Um, so, for example, how many of you would say that at the beginning of a day, you have a you have a plan for how the day is going to go, by the time you get to the end of the day, it did not go according to plan. Would you say that happens to you sometimes? Yeah, um, and that's just part of life. But that doesn't mean that things are not going outside of what God allows for you. Um, so God will use uh, circumstances and uh, things that you run into throughout the day to guide you um, through your life. Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 30 now. Isaiah chapter 30. And we'll read verse 34. Uh, let's see, is that right? go there, and it's not the verse that you were intending to read. Thankfully, I have a phone with a Bible app and a search function on there. So we'll do a quick search. And the correct verse that I intended to read was verse 21. <laughs> that's in chapter 30, verse 21. Apparently, that's not being of notes this morning. I did not do a precise job. Um, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left. Um, so who is it that speaks to us, directing us where to go? Holy Spirit. Um, yes, so it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us and guides us. So three primary ways in which God reveals his will to us, we have scripture, uh, we have circumstances of life, and we have the Holy Spirit. Um, so how does the Holy Spirit speak to us? I think in terms of the practical ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, uh, the Holy Spirit has many different methods that he can use, and depending on your personality and your relationship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit may speak to you differently, with different methods than he speaks to me. 
Um, some examples, though, of how he could possibly uh, speak. Um, certainly, you know, we can think of um, those one-time strong but immediate uh, thoughts that pop into your mind um, that kind of takes your attention. When you have a conviction, when you hear, read, or see something, um, you know, possibly to do or not to do something, or wh whether something is good to do or, or wrong to do, um, those convictions can take a hold of you, and that can be a way that the Holy Spirit um, speaks to you. Um, he may also uh, speak to you, um, perhaps he impresses on your mind a certain idea on your mind um, without you trying to think about it. Uh, so this is different than your brain's like natural worry or obsession about a topic. But you just feel like outside of your own natural tendencies or the specific thought that keeps being pressed upon your mind. That could be the Holy Spirit trying to bring something to your attention. Um, and then also in terms of um, things coming to your mind, uh, it could be that God will bring up an issue to you repeatedly. So you hear some sort of thought or issue mentioned in a sermon, and then you read about it in the Bible, and then you hear a friend talk about it, and then you hear another friend talk about it, and then you see something mentioned in a book, or, you know, you can go on and on and on, but um, if you hear this one idea mentioned, and you don't normally pick up on this, but all of a sudden you've heard it like ten times, uh, perhaps that is a way that the Holy Spirit is bringing something to your attention. Um, one thing to remember is that the Holy Spirit may often lead us step by step. Uh, I'm not sure I've heard of anyone who's been told their entire life plan at one time. I think God tends to lead us step by step. Um, so, if you happen to be under conviction about a certain issue, uh, you will likely need to deal with it before God will show you what the next step of his will is. Sometimes God will not reveal more of his will to us if we are not following what he has already revealed to us. So, three primary ways. Scripture, circumstances, and the Holy Spirit. So then, even more specifically, when it comes to your career or other decisions in your life, um, what are some guiding principles or guiding decisions that you can use um, as you consider uh, possibilities and choices that you have before you? Um, one thing I would say is to consider whether God has given you a specific mission or a specific call. We have biblical uh, examples of this. Uh, one that comes to mind is the example of Paul. Um, so, for example, uh, if you were to go to the very first verse of 2 Timothy, Paul would start off by saying, I am Paul, and I am apostle by, called by Jesus. He felt that in a very real way, Jesus spoke to him and said, I want you to be an apostle. Um, and so he had that mission, that calling to do that um, as a career and as a ministry. Um, so if you feel like God has given you a specific mission or calling, then do it. Um, follow it. Um, not everyone has a life calling, and that's okay. Um, my brother and I have had this discussion several times before. We do not feel like we have specific life callings, um, and that's okay. Um, so, if you don't have a specific mission or life calling, then second guiding question you can ask yourself, um, do you have any passions or skills that leads towards a specific career or ministry? Um, God has, in, your, in his creation of you as a unique individual, has given you talents and skills um, that make you different from the person sitting next to you. Um, so consider that and incorporate that into your uh, decision making. And then the third guiding question I would say is, are there any, uh, is there anything in the Bible specifically for or against um, one of the choices that you're deciding on? So is there a specific commandment or principle for or against it? Would this choice lead me to walk towards God or away from Him? Or would this decision um, be a help or a hindrance towards helping others. Um, guiding principles um, that we can use when making decisions. Um, I heard somebody say once, um, I don't remember who said it, but this is a quote, it's not my original thought. If you walk in God's ways, you will be in his will. Um, and so that's something that stuck with me um, when I heard that.
Um, but some questions come to mind when thinking about this specific topic, and I'll ask all of you this. Um, what do you think is the difference between personality and character? Because certainly, I believe um, all of us would be under the conviction that God wants us to share his character, but I don't think all of us are to have the same personality. So what is the difference between those two? And please speak loudly when you talk, because I can't always hear everyone very clearly. Personality is like a humor, like yourself, how you are, but your character is like at heart. Okay, yeah, personalities. Um, like the, you, she, uh, Michelle mentioned, humor, with, um, like your some of your social tendencies. Um, Character is more of the heart, more um, like moral habits in your life, perhaps we could say. Um, Jack? I would say personality is something that's more innate and natural. Everyone has their own personality. They're born with it, they grow with it, like it does grow with them. But character is something that we can consciously to work on and to grow and it's through our actions and our choices. Okay, yeah. So personality does, it can shift over time, but it's more innate to how we're designed. Character is something that we choose to live with, so to speak. Cool. Um, Autumn, or no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so personality is who you really are as a person, and character is it's molded by your experiences. What you say. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Maybe one more thought on that difference between personality. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay, character is who you are when no one's looking. Very good. Um, okay, another question, or I guess on that, um, you know, some of the, some biblical characteristics that I think God wants everyone to have, uh, the list of the fruit of the Spirit comes to mind. So love, joy, peace, patience, um, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I learned this uh, Steve Green song when I was a kid that listed all of them. So I'm trying to like, go through the song in my head and uh, remember all the lists. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, those are character attributes. God wants all of us as followers of him to have those same character attributes. Uh, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, but that doesn't mean that your personalities become uniform. Your personalities stay uh, distinct from each other. Okay, um, another question. Then what role does your individuality and creativity play in following God's will? Do you, does God take your personality into consideration when planning his will for you? So, yes. Um, some, some things I was thinking about with that. So, for example, uh, like, say, for example, you know, Jesus gave his disciples the commission, great commission, go into the world and make more disciples. Uh, well, how are you going to do that? Well, you get to choose how you do that. Your personality, your creativity, your mind, you can determine a way in which you can share Jesus to other people and make more disciples. Um, there's not a limited number of strict boxes of how to do that. Although, you know, there's ways in the church that we tend to mention more often than others. Um, you get to let your individuality be on display and still carry out God's will in your life. Does that make sense? Um, and if, if you are not the creative type and you need ideas, then that's what the church community is for. We can help and, and partner with you uh, to do that. I think the same could go for church involvement, too. Um, certainly, we have a list of, like, 
positions in the church that you can volunteer for. Um, but just because there's not a certain idea on the list doesn't mean that you can't do that. So if you have something that you feel like you can contribute to the church that's not currently being done, then speak up and we're happy to have your involvement. And we want to we want you to use your passions and skills for the Lord. And we don't want to be here and say, no, you can't do that. That's not on our church. That's not on our church position list. Uh, if God is leading you in that direction, we'll make room for you to, to serve him. And then the final question, uh, I kind of hinted at this with the question earlier, does God dictate whether you does God choose which shirt you should wear for the day? Um, the question would be, does God dictate our life decisions, or does he give us the freedom to make choices? So I'm hearing freedom. Okay, great. Um, now, you know, we can, we can list what the two extremes are. Uh, there's two, the first extreme is where God dictates every decision down to what you'll wear and what pen you'll use when taking notes. Um, there is, there are, um, how do I say this? There are theological beliefs and philosophies that state that, that that is how God operates. Um, we would know that as like predestination and determinism, for example, that God has planned out all of your actions in advance. And you're just simply executing what God has specifically dictated you'll do. Um, it doesn't quite seem right. The other extreme is that God has given you biblical principles and a mind, and you can adequately make your own decisions every, every time you have a decision. Um, that's the other extreme that also has um, theological roots in the history of Christendom. Um, Pelagius comes to mind as a, one of the early Christians that have that idea. Um, I don't think that's quite right either. I think the, tr the truth is somewhere in the middle of those, those two extremes. Um, and that's why I believe that reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, God gave us individuality and personality for a reason. However, uh, there are times where we need God's intervention and power in daily living to overcome our weaknesses and deficiencies and give glory to God. Even if you knew what the right decision was, we need God's assistance. Uh, to carry it out. That's why I think it's somewhere in the middle. God will certainly not dictate every life decision for you, um, but even if he doesn't, I think we should cultivate an attitude where we have a willing heart to follow if God does give you specific instruction to carry out. And certainly God's will for one person's life will be different from another's, um, but it's important that we have a relationship with God that will allow us to hear him as he may tell us what his specific will is. Um, like uh, mentioned in the book of Psalms, the attitude of the Messiah, I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. So Jesus, when he was human, he had the attitude that if God the Father would give a specific direction for his life that day, he would be willing to carry it out. But if not, he had the general attitude that he wanted to give glory to God no matter what he did. And so for the final verse, let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. It's perhaps one of the most quoted passages in the Bible, but it's a good one for a reason. This is why we're going to read this before we finish. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So how many of you today will choose to put your trust in the Lord and ask him for a willing heart to do his will and to see your hands? Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for revealing your will to us. Thank you that you care and that you want to be involved in our lives. And so we give you our hearts. We ask that you would shape and mold it um, because we want to give you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much, Chris, for that message today. Amen. Amen. We are going to end our service today with our closing song, hymn number 537, He Leadeth Me. Hymn number 537. If you are able to, please join me in standing as we sing hymn number 537.